Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Howard with another episode from the Church in Tennessee Ministries. I'm the Servant of God Minister for the Church in Tennessee Ministries. And I want to thank everybody that's watching this episode. And I pray that I'm able to enrich you with the information that God is using me to give. Uh, also enrich you with the doctrine and a better understanding of the scriptures. So this week we're still on a subject of love and we're looking at love from the perspective of God and how God loves the world. We're in John 3.16 or 3.1 through 3.16. <clears throat> We've got the scriptures on the board from last week still and I may erase those at some point. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So as we looked at that, we're looking at it from the viewpoint of how God loves the world and what that, what that word means, that word love means. Now we already went over what the word love means. We looked at it etymolog etymologically speaking, meaning from a history of what it meant initially uh, from the pro-Germanic language, proto-Germanic languages from the early languages in the history of the American language. <clears throat> okay. So, as we went through that, love basically from an English perspective or the English definition is affection. It has the idea of affection for something. I love my cousins, I love my brother, I love my mother, I love my father, I love beer. I love crack cocaine, I love weed. It just means to have a great affection for. So the idea of a social or moral aspect of it is not inherent in the meaning of the, of the English definition or the, meaning, or the English word love. It's not inherent in that. Now, as far as agape or agapatos, which is the Greek word that was translated into the English word love, you can look at that from a social or moral perspective. And in this verse, that's the meaning of it from an elementary principle meaning of the word love that was translated from agape or agapato, uh, agapatos. All right. So we're still on that. <coughs> Excuse me. And the word agape, let me, let me say this. When God says he so loves the world, and we looked at the word so, the word so, so is the word hoitos, all right? And it means in man, in this manner, or in this way which precedes or follows. So when he says he so loved the world, he's saying, in this fashion did I love the world. Now in this verse, we've gone over other verses that set the precedent for understanding what God means when he says he loves the, he so loves the world. He's not talking about having a great affection for the world, all right? He's not talking about having affection for the behavior of the world. And there's plenty of verses that, that indicate that and set that, that uh, principle forward. When you look at 1 John 2, 16, where he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world is love the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But who, but whosoever doeth the will of the, the will of God shall abide forever. All right. So that verse right there flies in the face of the the notion that God has great affection for the world. No, God has great care for the world. I don't necessarily have to like you to show concern for your plight, or to show concern for the, the current situation you may be in, current adverse circumstances you may be in. And in this particular verse, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about God wanting to promote the welfare of all of mankind. God showing great care and concern for all of humanity. How? How is he doing that? By way of making a, a way unto life by sacrificing his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the part of the verse that we're going to look at today. For God so loved the world that he gave. This is the fashion in which God loves the world. 
he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son, that, what's the word I'm looking for? That act is a part of who God is. It's a part of his nature. It's essentially who he is at his core, to do what is right by all of mankind. Not only believers, but unbelievers as well. Now, he only has affection for believers. doesn't have affection for unbelievers. It's gonna, and when I say he doesn't have affection for unbelievers, I'm not necessarily talking emotion and hate, things of that nature. I'm just saying that the essence of who God is is to make sure he does right by all of mankind, okay? So let's embrace this real quick. All right. We'll go to this part right here. He gave his only begotten son. sons of God, right? Aren't we sons and daughters of the Most High? Well, yeah, but when he says that, what he's referring to is the only one directly from him. This is not a reference to his divinity, but the form that he took in flesh, okay? So when we look at the word begotten, only begotten, right? Let's put it right here. That's the word. Monogenes, right? Mono means one or only. And genomai means to cause to become or generate. All right. Cause to become or generate. <clears throat> so he's the only one directly from the Father that was caused to become or to be generated, right? His physical form. He came in, came here in the form of flesh. He was partaker. He was partaker of flesh the same way the children were. All right. That's not talking about his divinity. He was God from the beginning. In fact, in the book of John, it says, "In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God." All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right? So, he's not, it's not a reference to his divinity, but his natural birth. So let's look at these scriptures. Again, we're expounding on scriptures so we can get a better understanding, so we can use this practically in our lives, so we can have a better understanding of how we're supposed to behave towards uh, those that don't believe God or those that are having a difficult time believing in God from the perspective of how God would look at it, from the perspective of how God would teach and convey this information to those that don't believe. All right. <clears throat> so in John 1 14, this is a few times this word begotten was used. And what we're referencing here is, is that this scripture is a reference to the physical form that he took on, spoken into existence. Mary was the inception of Christ, of Emmanuel, 
was through the Holy Spirit and was spoken into existence. All right. I'm just going to start at verse 13. No, I'm going to start at verse 13. Speaking of the word, speaking of Christ, I'm going to start at verse 8. He was not that light, but was sent to build. With... No, I'm not going to start at verse 8. I'm going to start at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Meaning the Jews. Talking about the Hebrews, the Israelites. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, let me stop right there so I can give you an understanding of what he's talking about. That verse there is a reference to the ways that a man could be proselytized or become inducted into the, the culture and, and tradition and religion of the Jews. Now, how do I know that? Well, God just magically gave it to me in my head. That's how I know. <laughs> no, that's not how I know. I, what does the Holy Spirit do? The design of the Holy Spirit is to lead and to guide you into all truth. All right? The Holy Spirit design its function and purpose in the life of every believer is to lead and guide them, guide them into, into truth, to strengthen them, to cause them to endure, to cause them to search, all right? The Holy Spirit is not going to make you do backflips, cop lock in the pew. It's not going to make you do that. Now, you may feel good about God, and you may feel excited about the blessings that God has brought in your life, and your emotions and your flesh will make you do that. I'm not necessarily, per se, saying that's wrong. I'm saying to attribute that to the Holy Spirit is not in accordance with Scripture. That's what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is not going to make me do this here. That's, that's not what it's going to make me do. The Holy Spirit, in John 16, 13, it says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come? This is Christ talking to the disciples. <clears throat> How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come? He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. He's not going to speak of himself. But that which he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He's going to receive from the Father. He's going to give it unto us, all right? He's going to show us. He's going to drive us, influence us to seek all truth, all right? With that being said, this book is called Commentary on the New Testament from the Talmud in Hebraica, Volume 3. All right. This is a reference guide to its commentary on the scriptures and a reference guide concerning the circumstances that Christ is addressing as he's teaching, as he may be reproving, as he may be chiding some of the people there, the religious leaders there, and the, your common folk. Okay. So in this book, it gives you an understanding of what he's talking about, what he's addressing, what John, the beloved of Christ, is addressing. So when he says, which were born, meaning the regeneration of believers, the sons of God, we're born by the Holy Spirit. Okay? We're not born, we, we don't come into the fold through water. Now, yes, I understand. It's a revelation to the people that see and to yourself that you're believing in God. But of a truth, the fact that you're there inside the church is a revelation that you're seeking God, that you're seeking truth, that you're seeking after something that's calling you out of darkness into his marvelous light. All right? So when he says which were born, not of bloods. So we're born, we're regenerated by the Holy Spirit, born 
knocked of bloods. Now you're probably asking yourself, why do I keep saying bloods? And the scripture says blood. Actually, when you break that word down and you parse it, it's in plural. It really should have read been translated bloods, but <clears throat> they translated it blood, but the word is actually plural. When he says the ones that's normal that's not born of bloods, what he's referencing is the thought that you can come into or you can be a part of or inception into the kingdom of heaven by way of the covenant, how the Israelites or the Jews came out of Egypt back during the time of Moses. They came out of Egypt through the Passover, but to become a part of the Israelite religion or the Hebrew or Jewish religion, to be a follower of Jehovah God, you had to be circumcised, okay? So when they say bloods, they're referring to that references to the covenant that God made <clears throat> with the Israelites and with himself, okay? That's what that's a reference to, okay? Or as they came out of Egypt, actually, and they made that covenant afterwards, all right? So you cannot come into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, by way of bloods, all right? Nor of the will of the flesh. So let's say this is the covenant. Will of nor sorrow, nor of the will of of the flesh, lineage or birth. You can't be physically birthed into the kingdom of heaven. You can't come down the pipe through your lineage and get into the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again by the Holy Spirit. You must have a new birth from above, Anathan. It must, it must come from God. It must, you must be elected by God. Now, we don't know who that is. That's why the gospel's preached. All right? For whom he did for know, he also did predestinate, conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren over there in Romans 8 and 28. All right? And what John is telling us by the Spirit, by way of Christ, is that you just can't come into the kingdom of heaven through the covenant. You can't come in there through birth or through lineage. And... You can't come in there by the will of man, nor the will of man. Proselyte. Proselyte baptism is a reference to the, the certain sex during that time, the, the, uh, Essenes, that was a sect, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Those were the three sects during that time. I forgot what it was last time I was talking about. I just remembered. All right. <clears throat> so they had a, a, a way of baptizing people into their religion and just multiplying new uh, members unto their religion and What's the way I want to put it? Associating the new members that they've inducted in with righteousness. All right. And how you would proselyte, how you would proselytize a member or a Gentile was they would pour, either pour water on their head or have them wash in water. I can't remember which one right now. They have to offer up two turtle doves as a sacrifice. In Leviticus, I can't remember the chapter, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, sins. There is no remission of sins, sins without shedding of blood. That, why, that is why 
it was necessary to land once and for all. All right. And then sometimes they would they would take on a new name in commemoration of Jacob, how Jacob took on a new name. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. All right. So, nor will a man. You can't will someone into the kingdom of God. You can't make them a part of the kingdom of God just because you want them to be. All right. We have a habit sometimes to say, that's my cousin, that's my friend. I mean, that's my cousin, that's my brother. But not physically. Talking about on the spiritual level. You just can't will somebody into the family. So that's what Christ is talking about. So it says, not of blood, right? Nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. The only begotten of the Father. And we can see that the reference, the context, is about Christ coming in the flesh concerning us. He came unto his own. So we don't belong to ourselves. Let's keep going. All right. Verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The only one generated by God. The inception of God in the flesh from the Father by way of the Word. No man hath seen God at any time a reference to his divinity, right? The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. In verse 14, a reference to his physical form that he came in. Mary was impregnated without semen. Christ was essentially spoken into existence. The word seed, Mary was impregnated without a male seed, right? The word seed in the Bible is the word sperm. And sperm or sperm is the seed of a man that gives life to the egg inside a woman's womb. The word was spoken. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. All right? And then in verse 14, what does it tell us? And the word was made flesh. Okay? Let's keep going. 318. John the Baptist. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That word name is probably the word onoma. It means authority and character. He has not believed on the authority and the character of Christ, and he is condemned already if you do not believe. Whoever is looking at this, if you don't believe in the character and authority of Christ, you're condemned already. This is what John tells us. I'm not talking about people that don't believe. If you believe Scripture, this is what the Scripture tells us, okay? And then 1 John 4, 9. Let's go to 1 John 4, 9. 1 John. Or nine. All right. Verse 7. Beloved, speaking to believers, if you go throughout Scripture and you read this Bible, if you decide to read it front to back, I've read this Bible from front to back, maybe a couple of times. All right. And at the time I did that, early on, I had no clue as to what it was talking about. <laughs> I didn't get an understanding until later on. 
But if you read it, you're not really going to see, you're only going to see maybe one, you're gonna, only going to see two references to, to the term Christian as a reference to believers. We were called saints by each other, beloved believers. That reference of Christian was given to believers by Rome. All right? Beloved, let us love one another. Now remember, he's, he's, this book is actually written to believers, those that have the ability to see and hear and discern. It's not written to unbelievers because an unbeliever doesn't believe what it says. And it's never, it never was written to unbelievers. It's written to believers. So that when you come out your unbelief, you have a book of instruction to show you how to live in this world. Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Now, within this word love is also incorporated the idea of affection for one another, okay? Because that's who we're told to have affection for as the believers. Even if you have to distance yourself from a believer, we're not supposed to do it as if they're enemies. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might have life through him, so that everyone would have an opportunity at life, and life more abundantly. All right? Oh, what time is it? 256. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back next week and we're going to look at we're going to look at the fact that God gave his only begotten son and we're going to look at those verses that show that Christ came in the flesh. He was put to death for our sins. For the sins of those out of the world that believe on him. Thank you guys for joining me today. Please be blessed. Please be safe as you do as you're journeying or as you go through your travels. Pay attention to your surroundings. Pay attention to your children. Instruct your children. Instruct your young teenagers. Instruct your young men, your young women in the ways of life. The Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Please be safe out there. You guys stay blessed. Have a good day.